Okay, so welcome back to part three, the last part this week uh, for the lectures. So <clears throat> uh, sometimes we need to uh, reclassify or declassify, right? So over a period of time, the need to protect information is going to change, and our policy should address uh, this too. So the process of downgrading sensitivity, sensitivity levels is known as declassification. And the process of upgrading a classification, if you had to do that, is known as reclassification. So uh, there are really three primary ways by which data is declassified, uh, and your policy can address this. It can be automatic, it can be over a systematic review, or it can be over um, some sort of mandatory review. Uh, in 2013, the U.S. government began to move towards releasing records, FYI, when they were 20 years old instead of 30, which was the old standard. So, uh, to, to, further, uh, two further years worth of government records are being transferred to us each year until 2022, which is kind of around the corner when we will receive the records from 2001 and 2002, right, as they uh, catch up. Just interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> moving then to labeling and handling standards. So um, information owners that we've talked about are going to classify information in order to identify the level of protection necessary. And so in uh, chapter two, we talked about standards, that standards serve as specifications for the implementation of our policy. And they can dictate mandatory requirements. Handling standards then are going to di dictate by classification level how the information is stored, transmitted, communicated, accessed, etc. And labeling is the vehicle for communicating the assigned classification to information custodians, right? So, uh, you know, why, why would we even uh, do this, right? Uh, labels make it easy to identify the data classification. And they, they can take many forms. A label can be electronic. It can be uh, printed and on a sticker and put on a document audio, visual, right? You may, need, uh, you, you may need to label in multiple ways the same item, right? So whether you're giving it in a presentation or storing it in a folder. So you, you recognize, uh, you know, for example, labeling. Does it really have an impact? Well, have you ever seen a truck drive down the road with skull and crossbones on it? And you kind of know, oh, that's hazardous material. You may not know what it is, what kind of hazardous, but you know it's hazardous material. So labeling does work, right? And so we want to apply it to um, our data also. There are, uh, I did want to mention that proper labeling is going to help us avoid, and so the policy that goes with it, help us avoid mishandling information uh, on a storage me media, like if we have a DVD, right, or tapes. Uh, compact discs are sometimes used CDs to store small sets of data as uh, while backup tapes and DVDs are used for the larger sets of data, right? And this um, <clears throat> actually happened in um, uh, that young uh, army soldier who took a bunch of data from uh, his unit and gave it to uh, one of the PEDIA sites, the... Uh, WikiLeaks, I think. Uh, he was actually bringing in a CD that looked, that was labeled as uh, some music nobody suspected, and he was using that to copy secure data onto and leaving at the end of the day with his CD uh, that labeled as music. So uh, we want to be very careful here. Now on page, uh, so. When we talk about information security uh, standards, uh, there is on page 137 to 138 of the book, uh, sampling, sample handling standards matrix. It's great. 
really worth uh, going over, right? So for example, it'll, it'll list the data handling standard you should be aware of. So for servers, it has uh, a definition for protected, confidential, or internal. For workstations, right? It'll have, for, so for protected, that data is not allowed on a workstation. For confidential data, that data is not allowed on a workstation. And for internal data, it notes that it's allowed uh, as required for business purposes, right? Uh, data storage, right? It mentions for protected, must be encrypted. For confidential, must be encrypted. And for internal storage, uh, highly recommend encryption, right? Talks about workstations at home and protected confidential and internal information. What about email, right? That protected should be avoided and confidential should be avoided, but internal messages are allowed, etc. What about external file transfer, like to a USB? Uh, it recommends for protected that that information data should be uh, pre-authorized by a senior vice president, and for confidential also pre-authorized. Yet uh, for a USB, for example, that external file transfer is allowed and encryption is recommended. So your policy, my policy, would require uh, encryption on uh, portable devices like that. The list goes on and on. It's worth your time to review. It talks about disposal on page uh, 138. Um, so protected must be cross-shedded. Protected data has to be cross-shredded, right? Um, for storage of paper documents in a secure cabinet, for example. Uh, if there's a breach, right, what you should do and uh, data, who you address data handling questions to. Uh, it's just a great summary chart, worth your time. Now, uh, the information secure uh, systems inventory, right, uh, is the next topic. Many organizations do not have an up-to-date inventory of information, right? Uh, the most prevalent issue is a lack of centralized management and control. And, um, a lot of the times this happens because of mergers and acquisitions, right? And you lose track of things, but still the issue is there. So what should be inventoried it becomes the question, right? Uh, and so it's a critical decision in choosing what attributes of the information asset you want to record. Uh, and so we would want to address hardware assets, software assets, and uh, hardware assets would be like computer equipment, uh, printers, um, networking equipment like an IDS and IPS, firewall, modems, routers, um, access points, cables. Storage should be addressed under hardware. Those are the magnetic tapes, discs, CDs, DVDs, USBs, uh, etc. Now, software assets should also uh, be inventoried, including the OSs. Uh, the productivity software and application software. Application software, that which is really designed to implement the business rules, often custom developed internal to the uh, company. Um, and so uh, inventory becomes very important. Uh, here's here the slide summary of um, hardware and software, and you can read more about that at the end of the chapter uh, five at your leisure. Now, I just wanted to make some final points about policy as we have been uh, addressing them here. Um, that there are management policies. Earlier, we talked about administrative policies. I wanted to mention some management policies you might consider, like a privacy policy. Next is the data classification policy I've mentioned. Uh, we talked about data retention and a policy. Uh, and continuing education would be an important part of this. The best dollar spent in cybersecurity is in education. And of course, you'd want to have a policy to address asset disposal. Now, I also wanted to mention that um, addresses, IP addresses, right? Uh, and MAC addresses. Th there are physical and logical addresses. When we're uh, inventorying 
and assigning policy, we want to uh, record addresses, right? And we want to be specific to the location. I've had to replace. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I've I've had to replace. WAPs, WAPs before all over the country and the work that was required because accurate detailed addresses, second floor, end of the hall, in room seven, back right corner, that kind of detail can be important. But then there are the logical addresses you want to make sure you capture that every device connected to the network has this unique identifier, right? And so a MAC address and an IP address and the domain name are all things you'd want to record and you would want to address that in your policy, I think, uh, or at least in the uh, standards. The MAC address, right, just to, as a refresher, you uniquely identifies your a device, like your computer you're on right now has a MAC address, right? And, um, uh, and it, it comes from the manufacturer and it's assigned to your NIC card, right? Uh, <clears throat> and so the IP version 4 address or IP version 6 address uh, also record that. Uh, the IP address is that unique identifier of a device or the internal network, right? And uh, the version 4, as you know, is that group of four, it's at four octets right uh, and it represents numbers between 0 and 255 IP version 6 is the same but it it's it's it uniquely identifies a device or the internal network but it's a 128 bit identifier using eight groups of four hexadecimal digits and then the domain name service the humanly memorable names right how do I remember the name right I go to refdesk.com because I want to reference something. It's a, uh, it's great, right? That's how I remember it. And so that's the domain name, right? Um, uona.edu, right, is my domain name. And so this is assigned uh, by an internet registrar and usually uniquely describes uh, a set of devices, right? So www is an alias really for a specific device. When you access a website, the full domain name is actually translated to an IP address, which is going to define the server where the website is located, right? And so this is all performed dynamically using the domain name service, just to be aware. But uh, that's a review for most of you. Okay, I thought that was all some good information. I hope we enjoyed the time. I enjoyed my time with you. Uh, see you online.